All right, all right. Welcome, 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 everybody, to Not Normal Fridays at Five. I am your host here, the CEO and founder of Not Normal, and I'm glad to have you here with us. So, thank you again for tuning in for another episode. This has just been monumental. Everything that's happened in the past couple weeks. I've gone through a couple interviews and been working with my co-founders, and I couldn't say that I just. I can't wait to share all the exciting news we're building up right now. So we'll get to that soon. Um, but yeah, welcome back to another Not Normal Fridays at 5. And let's go ahead and jump right in. So today we have a very special guest, uh, somebody who I met through Clubhouse and just phenomenal, phenomenal guest. I, I couldn't be happier to have him on here. So uh, yeah, thank you, Shane. Why don't you introduce yourself? All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and hey, everyone, I'm Shane. Um, I use the pronouns he, her, they. I am based in Berkeley, California, where I am a technology instructor in the College of Environmental Design, where I teach digital design and sustainable urban planning. Uh, let's see, some of the other stuff. Uh, I'm a former public works commissioner, former planning commissioner for the city of Berkeley. Um, I host the room, How to Build a City on Mars, uh, on Clubhouse, in the club, Small Steps and Giant Leaps. Let's see here. I do several other things, but like it's yeah. Yeah, there's quite a bit there. You're all over the place, and I I, I love that. I mean, just hearing how many different things you you've got in. I don't know how you find the time for to to organize all of that, but organization is key, right? Uh, I'd say as well as a, a good team. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good there. All right. So I kind of want to jump into the first segment and just kind of get your thoughts on. There's so many different ways that people can find a path into the space industry, but not only that, but just to get inspired by space itself and what it is, what it means. And so what got you into space? Uh, that is a difficult question. Uh, there's a few times in my life where I can definitely think that, wow, this is a relevant space moment. Probably the earliest one was in kindergarten, first grade. Uh, one of the things I'd always doodle would be like a section diagram of an ant colony, but then I'd draw in people. And then in my mind, that was just be on other planets or the moon. Um, so that's when my mind started playing with the idea. Uh, let's see here. Uh, when I was in community college, I was really into space weather too. So I would, every single morning, I would watch basically solar weather, uh, which was really interesting, uh, helpful to learn about you know, the sun. Uh, and then as I proceeded into, uh, further into school, uh, whenever, so I studied architecture, um, I would always use Earth, the Moon, and Mars as my kind of sample sites and try to do comparatives. Um, and I think that's where I really got sold on the idea of space. Uh, and not to mention, I also discovered a really fun topic called aquaponics uh, in that time frame too. That, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting, you know, path to to discovering, you know, a passion for, for space itself. And I, I love that. I, I love that, you know, it started off early just thinking about it or just having, you know, some of those thoughts of, you know, what could be and then, you know, applying those or just, you know, you, utilizing them for brainstorming points, you know, later on when you're doing your studies, this architecture, um, a, lot, a lot of fun stuff there. And I, that's a really intriguing, like, way to get inspired by it. And so, you know, beyond that, there there's a lot to space. I mean, considering the industry, rocket engineering, I mean, orbital mechanics, you just have astronomy, you know, astrology, there's, you know, cosmology, there's, there's, <laughs> there's so many ways to, to find a passion for space and so many different things to love about it. But I have to know, what's your favorite thing about, about space? Uh, well, the possibility, uh, the unknown, the, uh, I mean, it's essentially a never ending unexplored territory. Um, but one of the things I get super excited about is that the technology that has gotten us into space is some of the technology that benefits us the most on earth. And so uh, the possibilities of what can come or what can be, I think is what uh, really gets me jazzed. Uh, I definitely agree with that. It's just pushing us further and further. You know, that's, that's kind of the point, you know, it's, it's almost this vast emptiness but there's so much to know so much to discover and learn and will give us a lot of insight on what to do here and that's that's all it's done so far and i love it so um that's great that's great to hear and so 
from there, I kind of want to dive further into, you know, your background, just, you know, how you got started and what built you up to be, you know, such an incredible person, just hands in all these different movements and different like ideas. And, you know, just give me, give me a little bit of information on you. Uh, well, so I did not have a linear path to where I am today. That is for certain. Um, for example, I, I was a high school dropout. Um, so got off, I would say not necessarily on the right leg, um, but definitely started get, getting going in a direction. Um, but uh, after high school, I ended up going to night school and graduating. Um, I joined the military where I became an army medic um, and I was in the reserve. So while doing that, I was also working for the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, which is a very healthcare uh, city. Essentially, the entire city is a hospital. <laughs> um, and so I had a lot of just medical background all throughout my education, well, K-12 education, uh, just because it's such a large factor where I grew up. And I'm very, very, very fortunate to grow up where I did grow up. Um, but it also really rooted wellness and health and preventative care into like the foundation of my career exploration uh because then after being in the medical field for a while uh, i transitioned well i moved to california switched my career started studying architecture uh but also really like drove the wellness into the built environment elements um, <clears throat> which has helped me develop a, a slightly different style of architecture and urban planning um from there let's see here goodness already getting lost um, yeah, there's so much there and so I, I like the idea of, you know, almost applying that health and wellness to the architecture side. I think that's a really intriguing idea. So like, and that's, I guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that what kind of led to this like user-centric design, this kind of yep. like path that you've built for yourself now? Can you give a little information about that? Yeah. So um, a fun little fact, um, I'm sure people who like NASA have heard of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, a lot of work that NASA has done over the past several decades has been very focused on uh, propulsion technology. Um, and so you know, rockets, um, not necessarily considering the environment that the astronauts are living in, or um, you know, they, they've gotten better with ergonomics moving forward. Um, but my personal journey through architecture, um, so I went to City College of San Francisco to get AA in architecture, and then I transferred to UC Berkeley in the College of Environmental Design, which is actually where uh, I have uh, the privilege to teach at um, now. And while I was going to architecture school, um, I kind of discovered that architecture pedagogy wasn't the most user-centric, so to say. Um, it's, it's very harsh. Uh, anyone that's been to architecture school, um, there's very little sleep, a lot of work, a lot of criticism. Uh, and so I just kind of started questioning that kind of pedagogy. Um, people call out kind of like the old boys school mentality a lot. Um, and that was very relevant. That I mean, that was very much so the case uh, in architectural pedagogy. And so as a student, um, I've been a very outspoken activist. Um, when I was in uh, the College of Environmental Design for undergrad, I founded Wellness Affairs, which focused on the students, well, their wellness, um, as well as kind of doing an annual survey just so we could have a measure of what needed to be addressed and all that uh, good stuff. Uh, and it was really cool. This The campus adopted that and started uh, uh, following that habit. Um, and it actually has improved a lot of stuff. But also, I was involved in the undergraduate student council, too. So. Um, that helped me have a voice and give voice to other people. Um, however, it did not help me in architecture. Um, I was kind of put into a position where I was unable to complete the courses in a very specific set of steps. And so I had the choice of uh, switching to urban planning, landscape, uh, architecture, or sustainable environmental design. Or I had a fourth option, which was create your own major. And so I was really intrigued by that. Initially, I was going to create a major called astrotexture. Um, you know, like uh, astronaut architect kind of thing. But then when you really break that down to like the Latin, that means like star creation. And I was like, eh, that doesn't fit. 
Um, and so I was just working through like the fundamentals of what I was studying. Uh, my minor was architecture and social and cultural factors, in environmental design. Um, and so the social and cultural elements, I think is what really influenced the user centric design because so what user centric design is, um, it's very similar to human centered design. Uh, human centered design is very much so geared towards creating products for that you sell as a service. User centric design is more about optimizing the user experience before profits. So not the best business model, but it makes people happy. Yeah. Um, uh, but why I say user centric design is because it's not just humans that I'm taking into consideration. It is humans, plants, animals, and microscopic life, which are all very important and need to be simultaneously considered, especially when you're living in uh, contained environments such as space. Uh, and so kind of combining all that, uh, wrapping it in a design thinking approach is how I was able to create user-centric design. Um, and I'm very grateful for my professors that I had at CED uh, because uh, that type of architecture where you integrate the, the social sciences uh, kind of died off a little bit back in the 60s. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that's just a great approach, you know, just kind of shifting it back towards that user experience, especially when it comes to architecture. I mean, the the mindfulness of you to have that initiative, I think, is is just it's great. I love it because you're right. You're absolutely right. When we go to space and we start, you know, leveraging that sort of mentality towards you know, actually building a society, can, making these like facilities that house these people, it's going to be less about, you know, figuring out what's best for them later. <laughs> and like your business model that you said, I think is going to play into the hands of that so perfectly because it has to be user centric. It has to, you have to worry about the user experience first because the the mental experience that people go through when they are going to travel to other planets or travel to the moon or even to say a space station. I mean, that, that mental experience is going to be nested within the environment that you place them in. And so if, if the user experience isn't good when they get there, it's, it's going to throw a lot into like a certain loop. And I, I think it's great what you're doing, just shifting it back towards almost like people centered, <laughs> people centered architecture and, uh, but at the same time, being mindful of plants, animals, insects, microscopic life, I mean, all of that, because I think it all plays into the same like central unit of just making a healthy habitat. It, it, so <laughs> that seems very promising. So so tell me a little bit about Zedin. Yeah, so Zedin is a company that are a startup I created uh, a few years back, technically is started even earlier than that while I was in school. Um, uh, a friend and I were working on a research project, which is the aquaponics and sustainable urban agriculture. Aquaponics, what that is, it's basically like hydroponics, but you're using fish, like a little fish hatchery to naturally fertilize the plants. Um, whereas a lot of hydroponics now, there's four different uh, chemicals that you, you know, input to the system and then that would help with the growth. Um, my partner and I, we were researching this uh, and we we're exploring it through uh, land use and zoning. And what we discovered in that process is there's a lot of regulatory barriers uh, that basically made it near impossible to, you know, for there to be vertical farms in a lot of urban areas. Uh, and as we were picking through that, uh, we just kind of discovered a lot of nonsense uh, that is nationwide for the most part, uh, just controlling supply chains and whatnot. Um, and so we presented our research uh, to our class and we had a end of the year charrette where all the students voted and we ended up having like the best poster, research poster, which then encouraged us to submit that to another, um, a gala called Circus, which is held at, in the College of Environmental Design where PhD students, graduate students, uh, and undergrads uh, present their research in a fundraiser type, type uh, charrette. Um, and I did really well there too. Um, actually beat out a few PhD students um, thesis projects uh, as an undergrad. So that was really exciting. 
but it also was, I think, one of the times I was able to talk to the larger community outside of just CED about some of these things. Um, and so that's where I started pushing forward with this zoning and land use stuff, which actually ended up helping me uh, become a planning commissioner and public works commissioner, um, but also do work on California level uh, legislation too, um, which was not what I was expecting, uh, but very cool to see that I mean, it's a very agreeable thing. Yeah. So, yeah. And it seems like that was kind of a gateway to some of these things you have, you know, your hand in right now. So, you know, just, just leveraging that, you know, that experience and then, you know, pulling that forward and kind of gaining like an attraction, you know, to get part of these committees and what, and other things as well. So how, how did that like segue happen? And then what, oh, what are you doing now? Uh, so, I mean, once COVID happened, um, a lot of the work I would have otherwise been doing through ZDIN, uh, which is long range facilities planning. Uh, that's just like urban planning, but campus kind of focus. Some places have many campuses throughout many counties kind of thing. Um, and so a lot of that became volunteer effort stuff, uh, just because a lot of the rules had changed and people weren't hiring, uh, but I had relevant base knowledge uh, that could help. Um, sorry, I got a, lost, a little lost in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just, what, what are you have, because you've got a lot going on right now. Um, so what are the things that you're a part of right now? And then kind of the gate, like the segue from that into those things that you're doing now. So um, big things I'm doing right now, teaching, um, one of my favorite things, but then also involved uh, with my local communities, a lot of political advocacy uh, within the Democratic Party. Um, I've been also trying to take further, you know, get my foot further in the door with the space industry. Um, but I've been a bit hung up on this um, agriculture legislation, I think is what has kind of temporarily held me back, um, you know, making sure people are fed and whatnot. Um, but I mean, it all kind of overlaps this architecture. I think a lot of people when they're in architecture school don't realize how much they're going to be interacting with local governments. Um, and one of the things I discovered with my experience uh, of making friends and networking within the space industry is that politics are very relevant in space. It's not a topic a lot of people like to discuss. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but when it comes to you know, trying to get nuclear energy approved so you can you know, uh, uh, further science or you know, just get NASA funded, like it, those are very political things. Um, and so it's like they all unintentionally intersected and just me being me, uh, like pushing through and digging my heels into, well, uh, affect change, I guess, uh, upset the status quo. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I think what we need right now, is especially, I mean, just given, I guess, the times that we're in, but also just the impact that you're making, you know, through your passion as well and fueling it, like you said, it's interconnected. And I like that you're kind of finding those different bridges and, you know, jumping on those opportunities, making your impact and inciting change. I think I think that's phenomenal. Just I, I definitely admire you for putting you know putting so much on your plate, but then you know just standing for what you believe in, and then you know inciting change, making an impact. I think that's phenomenal. And so, um, is there any anything else that you're like really into right now? Is like is I mean you talked about like being really tight knit with the legislation side of it, so. Is there, is there any specific like committees that you're on or? Uh, yeah, so um, right now I'm the vice president of membership for the East Bay Young Democrats, um, as well as I'm a board member for the East Bay Stonewall Democratic Club, uh, which is an LGBTQ plus organization. Um, let's see here, some of the other stuff I'm doing. Um, I was a 2021 fellow for the New Leaders Council San Francisco chapter, uh, which is a, leadership training program for folks that are, you know, they interact within the political spheres. Um, and that was very useful. Um, really wonderful folks. Uh, if any of you have the chance, like uh, they're, they're, they're quality people uh, all around the nation. And so those are three of the biggest ones. Um, I'm also on the 
advisory committee for the Caltrans District 4, so that's like the entire San Francisco Bay Area, uh, regarding pedestrian uh, foot traffic and bikes uh, pertaining to the highway system. Uh, so that's another big Bay Area thing I'm involved in. Um, let's see here. I'm a potential candidate. So Advancing X is doing a um, career astronauts program, and I am part of that. I haven't been like officially selected or anything, but I'm like going through the process and hopefully maybe someday. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I get super involved in a bit too much. Um, like for example, I recently applied to be a NASA solar system ambassador. I'm here back beginning of next year. Um, yeah, I, I, I like these bureaucratic things that a lot of people might find rather boring. <laughs> Yeah, some people do, but I think there's just a lot of excitement in those, especially, you know, when it's, it's like you said, you almost inciting change, you're just being able to put yourself forward in that manner. I think it's, it's definitely takes a lot to, to approach yourself and push, you know, out towards so many different opportunities. But I think that's, you know, the heart of, of somebody who really wants to make an impact on the world is just, you know, going out there and, and making that difference. So I applaud you for that. And <laughs> You know, I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be great things that are coming out of that and will come out of that as well. But yeah, Advancing X, I've definitely looked into them and, um, you know, we might actually be, be talking with uh, Dr. Diaz a little bit, um, considering that like our model is uh, overlapping a little bit, you know, so at least for insight, we might go to him, but definitely an incredible program. And I, I hope you get selected because it's, it's really cool what they're doing. And I, I appreciate the lengths that they'll go to, to, to train somebody to get them to space and um, well, definitely exciting. So I hope he gets to take part in that. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, it's a super fascinating program for sure. Um, and I, I really hope you two do link up to have a conversation on your, uh, on this show, <laughs> but not on the show. Yeah. Most definitely. I, I'm looking forward to it. So hopefully we'll get that lined up. So yeah, that's, it's phenomenal just hearing like all of the things that you're doing. I think, it, I think it's great that, you know, you're doing so much. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the organization's a bit stressful at times, but I, I think to me, it speaks more volumes that you're going out there and making like such a big impact in so many different areas, whether, it, you know, it be through bureaucratic architecture, you know, and then, when it comes out to, I mean, just hosting like a couple brainstorming shows or uh, brainstorming sessions, you know, on Clubhouse for Small Steps and Giant Leaps, which honestly I th is easily the best club on Clubhouse. I mean, we, we can, I think we can both say that. I think Absolutely. just so many different great discussions that happen in there. And I can easily say I wouldn't be where I'm at right now if it wasn't for that club as well. So uh, I know that you host the, how to build a, Mar a colony on Mars and <laughs> always a great discussion there. I love what we talk about. Um, but I do kind of want to hear how, how you came in to not only Clubhouse, but then how you got into Small Steps and Giant Leaps, kind of how you've seen it grow and just what all, what all you're managing there. Can you give me some insight on that? Sure. Um, so I joined Clubhouse February 2021. Um, and it was introduced to me through uh, the New Leaders Council. Um, they just recommended we check it out. Um, and so I got an account. And the first night I was on there was a Sunday, which is when the Mars room typically is. Um, and that evening they were talking about space pirates. And that was like a six hour long conversation. Um, and I, I, you know, raised my hand, got on stage and like interacted. Um, and then later that night they had art in space too. And so I ended up being on clubhouse, I think for goodness, maybe 12 hours for the first time. Um, and it was kind of cool because I was like, you know, they're talking about pirates on Mars and they're talking about art in space. They're also talking about spirituality at the time too. So I was like, goodness, this is like my church. Um, and so I got hooked fairly early. Um, and I'm a person that has a lot of opinions and things to say. Um, and so it's not difficult for me to get on stage. Uh, especially, I guess I'm used to public speaking. I don't mind public speaking, otherwise very shy person, but um, like that just doesn't phase me. And so 
by continuously interacting with them and like just being part of the conversation, uh, you built trust. Um, they saw that, you know, even if I didn't know what I was talking about, I was at least asking questions or not specifically not trying to make something up if I didn't know. Um, and so I think I've been one of my biggest benefits when I went on clubhouse, I was my authentic self from the very beginning. Um, and so it was easy to be consistent. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that happened, I think around March, Clubhouse actually got hit by a huge wave of trolls that was just like flooding all the hallways. Um, and it's like the tone and the rhetoric of Clubhouse was just like, it was going downhill fast. Yeah, um, and I mean, so when I was a student at UC Berkeley, let's just say the climate uh between student groups was a little harsh there too so i had some training uh but basically i was just running around trying to dismantle all these like very racist bigoted questionably terroristic things okay. being said and accused on clubhouse um and kind of in that process i guess i was training people how to combat these trolls um and i think that's kind of what helps me connect with more people on clubhouse or to have a wider net uh, of a network. Um, but yeah, I've, every single week I would consistently uh, participate in these conversations. And then Alder, uh, who is the leader of uh, Small, Jeff, Small Steps and Giant Leaps, uh, asked if I wanted to be a moderate or a moderator, a regular moderator. And I ended up becoming just the regular host. Um, but that also made a lot of sense. For my architectural thesis or my undergrad thesis, I wrote about how to build sustainable architecture in space. Um, and that was heavily focused on Mars. And so it, a lot of radiation um, research, uh, as well as uh, micro meteorite mitigation and in that room. So not to like sidestep, it's on point, but yeah. it's slight sidestep. Uh, NASA's chief scientist, Jim Green, uh, goes into that room quite a bit. He actually, advised on the movie, The Martian. And so uh, what's really cool about how to build a city on Mars is that's where I was connected with Jim Green, uh, but also he's published a lot of papers and his research actually more or less validated my research. And so that was amazing for me because in the architecture world, no one's talking about space. Um, and so it's kind of a lonely world, um, but Clubhouse, I've been able to meet more space architects. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, I mean, bringing my genuine self forward, not lying or about who I am or what I do or what I've done, I think is what has helped me grow, um, but also give more credibility to small steps and giant leaps because we bring in, you know, folks from NASA, um, scientists from around the world, and we encourage people that no matter what their career is in life, like they could be working at a gas station they're welcome on stage and we want to hear their thoughts and opinions. Like we want to know what their interpretations are of what's being said. Like it's, we believe space is for everyone. Like yeah. that is, that, that has never been different the entire time I've been there. And so it's, I think that's why small steps and giant leaps has grown so much is because they're bringing people in. They're not, they're not isolating folk because they don't have a certain kind of degree or whatever title. Um, and so, yeah, and it's as far as social medias go, um, you can hear tone of voice uh, and really connect with people. Whereas if you read a Facebook post from like two weeks ago, you don't know what their tone was. You don't know like all these other variables that tend to make these social medias rather awful. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend Clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, that was the definitely what I what I picked up from it as well when I first joined was that kind of inclusive nature of the club and I think that's why I latched on to it as well I, I think when I first got on clubhouse it was my sister who brought me on and just they're like you need to get on here and so I was, uh, and I was like oh well let me find a club about space <laughs> and then small steps and giant leaves popped up hopped in a hopped in a couple of rooms and just talking about great things and like you said uh, it's it's more about like bringing people in which I've I found like the inclusive community of it to be amazing and you're absolutely right when it comes to the social media aspect because instead of getting a snapshot of what somebody was at the moment or something they created um, 
you're getting yeah their their voice their tone and you're getting it at that moment you know their thoughts in that moment and so it's a lot more a lot more i guess not personal but like engaging you know it's like a deeper you, connection you can definitely sense when people are being vulnerable um like you can hear the quiver in their voice whereas like otherwise you're reading all capitals kind of thing and so it's not it's very intimate but i don't know if intimate is the right way to describe it but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> I think that is a good way to describe it because I, I couldn't agree more. You know, you, you see you see like the people talking, but at the same time, you, you feel it in their voice sometimes, especially when they're outside of their comfort zone or, you know, they're, they're not really big on speaking on stage, but you can tell they're, they're doing everything they can to just kind of voice their opinion and be up there. And I, I think it's great because you you can sense those types of things and it's not really a mystery it's not really a question i mean the intonation the way people talk and then the types of discussions that are held i mean the way people bounce ideas off each other and i think it's just i it's it's great i think it's definitely a modern platform because we're we're almost drowning out this side of social media where you know it's more about you know this like i said those snapshots you know of of something whereas we want something more engaging more intimate you know that you can almost like feel or be a part of something in the moment i i could not agree more it's and one thing that's really cool is i found a lot of opportunities where people that aren't you know traditionally involved in the space industry have the ability to meet folk to get involved so like a good example is a deep space food challenge um, and that was just a bunch of uh, space nerds talking about how to grow food in space. Uh, and someone that was aware of this challenge going on was able to bring it into the conversation. And then a bunch more people were like, oh, well, I mean, I want to participate in that. And it's like, you don't have to be a NASA employee or anything like that. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a very groovy place. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. It just you know, again, bringing people in that aren't necessarily aligned to you know, people you would ordinarily think would be into space. And I think leveraging, you know, a platform like Clubhouse to further that idea is, is just so great. And definitely the place to be, you know, if you're into space, I, small steps and giant leaps, you got to be there. <laughs> but that's, that's great to hear kind of, you know, the, the sequential order that it took, you know, from just jumping on there from a recommendation to actually being so engaged and so, you know, in depth and moderating and, you know, putting, putting forth so many good ideas, networking, engaging, you know, it's, it's a great place. So, um, but from there, I guess we'll, we'll kind of jump into the latter half, you know, of this, of this segment, which, uh, don't get me wrong. We could talk about small steps and giant leaps all day. <laughs> There's so much, so many good conversations that we've had there. And so, to, to kind of jump beyond that, you know, with bringing people in to the community, you know, understanding that there's people out there that are, don't normally like do anything in the industry, but either want to get involved and, you know, are just are starting to get more passionate. I mean, all of these great things that are happening, not only in the industry, but um, these changes that we're making in the world. So, you know, bringing all of that together. I wanted to ask you, what does the future look like to you? Uh, to me, it looks like there's gonna be a lot more people in space. Um, currently, there's probably about somewhere around 200 that have been up uh, to about where the ISS is. Um, you know, pretty soon we're gonna see more than 200 people going up in a week. Um, where might they be going? Well, probably low earth orbit or the moon uh i personally want to go to mars and so uh hopefully both of those before getting there uh but yeah i see a, a thriving space industry um where a lot of people that would have never imagined themselves working in space are working either in a space adjacent career or something that you know might actually be on a different planet um i think that's becoming much more possible um, especially with STEM becoming STEAM, uh, that's STEM plus art, uh, it opens the door for a lot of people. So like even human resources, um, at like 
pretty much anything you can think of uh, is included in that. And so I foresee a lot of space art um, of all sorts of types, uh, probably a lot more, yeah, a lot more space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And just thinking about, you know, that kind of like future ahead of us is, I, I, I love thinking about it so much because I definitely have a similar vision. I mean, like you said, we're going to have 200 people even maybe going up at once, you know, at some point in the near future. So, and people really underestimate, you know, the, ex the acceleration of all of that and how fast we're moving towards that end. And I think it's going to blow people away. And yeah, I, I love that transition from STEM to STEAM, you know, adding an art, because that's a huge part of it. You know, that creative aspect of it, I think, is the one thing that we've kind of lost touch with, you know, especially when it comes to the space industry, because when you bring art into it, then it flourishes and becomes almost like a creative outlet at the same time, whether it be architecture, you know, painting, whether it be, you know, like rocket designs and stuff like that. Like we're seeing just like a massive push towards that area, whether it's photography. I mean, there's just bringing art into it. I think is I think it's just great. I think it's definitely an end that we need to push even further. So yeah, that's, that's a great outlook. You know, I, I love the idea of just being able to, to get more people out there. Personally, I'd like to spend a week on the moon. Um, I don't know about going to Mars. It's a bit of a long trip, but <laughs> long vacation. Um, but, you know, spend a week on the moon. Be nice, you know, being close to zero G for a little bit and just hopping around. Seems like fun other than, you know, the sharp regolith, but there, there's a lot of promise to that. And I think there's... And I think some people mistake that as optimism, but I think that's more of a realistic approach. I mean, the people that are in the industry and kind of attentive to what's going on, we know that that is inevitable. Just because there's people in place and people doing certain things and starting new things that it's, it's ramping up so fast. So, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to that kind of future, and bringing people in and making them like understand, you know, that this future is possible. So I want to hear your thoughts on just the importance of bringing awareness of the space industry to, to all corners of the earth. Um, well, I mean, I think inclusion is pertinent. Um, there's quite frankly, a lot of people that can't see themselves in the space industry just because you know, historically it's been a bunch of six foot tall, steely blue-eyed jet fighter pilots. Um, and that's not the case anymore. Um, like for example, SpaceX just sent out their first uh, fully civilian crewed mission, uh, Inspiration4. And that broke a lot of barriers. Um, you know, Cyan Proctor, the first black female to pilot uh, a mission as well as Haley uh, being the first person to go in space with a prosthetic. Uh, that opens the door for so many people who, you know, traditionally have been excluded. Um, and so I know NASA is working on broadening. NASA is working on being more inclusive with um, the requirements. And that's not, you know, an over the night process. And so it does take a bit of time, but uh, it's really nice to see that SpaceX can kind of help lead that way. Uh, we also see that with ESA, the European Space Agency, where they were recently soliciting a uh, astronaut with disabilities, so they can start can, uh, thinking about you know the ways in which these uh, habitations are like space habitations are occupied to be more accommodating uh, to 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 fit body types that are a little bit different from those six foot tall white men kind of situations. Yeah. Um, and so it just, it's kind of like redefining uh, a very systematic barrier that was instilled, installed a long time ago. Um, and it it's not easy to correct these things because one year you'd be like, oh, this is like not politically correct or whatever. Um, but like just, you know, people being able to make changes, uh, acknowledge how the past wasn't quite so inclusive, uh, but being able to act on that. Um, it, it's gonna take everyone to get us to the moon, Mars and beyond. 
uh, but also everyone can substantially benefit from that process too. Um, and I think it's really important that people feel that they have had some sort of say or been able to leave their mark on something this size. Um, and so if you, we can encourage people to get involved at a young age or uh, people of identities that had otherwise been more or less excluded, uh, it's going to create for a, a better functioning uh, and more effective uh, space community. Yeah, I could not agree more. That I think is just so fundamental because you're absolutely right. I mean, the whole stigma around like not only astronauts, but people that were like allowed to go to space was a very like exclusive type of thing. Like there was gatekeeping like crazy because they they weren't, you know, portraying this idea that, oh, this can be anybody, you know, even me, like I'm, I'm about to be 25, but I still grew up with that understanding that, oh, if I want to be an astronaut, if I want to fly to space, I have to you know, be the healthiest, most fit, smartest, sharpest, and I have to go fly jets, you know, for, for 10 years and then maybe get a shot, you know, at flying to space. So I still grew up with that mentality, that kind of like astronaut stereotype. And I couldn't agree more that the gateway to our future is breaking that down. And Inspiration4 is easily just the, the start of all of that, breaking down that, like, stereotype astronaut you know down to just being so inclusive and just allowing you know everybody to to grow up or to just move into this new idea that i like i can go to space like i'm i'm qualified i can do this it's it's not a matter of i have to be a certain way it's just i'm qualified to go to space because i'm a human and i think that inclusive nature is something that's going to carry so much weight into the future because the integration of space exploration and space travel into our society is is going to absolutely blow people's minds. It, it's just, it was the same way with the airlines. You know, they it used to be you know exclusive to people with a lot of money, and then next thing we know, I mean, there's planes flying all the time, and like you know couple couple hundred bucks i mean it's it's a little up right now but <laughs> but still it's it's that integration into our society and then it just becomes part of everyday life and space travel is going to end up being the same thing so i think you're right like there, there's always a way to make an impact there's always a way to leave your mark and that's definitely something i'm striving to solve is helping people find that sense of direction into that so um i definitely could not agree more so I do want to kind of pivot to this bigger segment, this like bigger question that I'm really trying to gain an understanding of because I think a lot of people have different viewpoints on this. And to me, it's very important because, you know, as it integrates into society, as we push further and all these amazing things are happening and as more people start to go to space, I, I want to know for the people that aren't interested in space or the space industry or the community who really aren't interested but i, I want to know what just everybody like if you're a human being like what should you know about space well i would say that what they should know about space is that a lot of the technology that uh they use in their daily lives and very likely are within four feet of them uh is something that has derived from the space industry uh, our cell phones are a great example of something that we wouldn't have had without uh, the space race. Um, or GPS, another good one, or even a memory foam mattress. Uh, these are all very common things that we wouldn't have or benefit or enjoy without the space race. Um, another great example is the electric toothbrush that was created to help people with disabilities brush their teeth. But now most people have an electric toothbrush. And so um, kind of to that same point, these technologies that improve our quality of life and have enhanced our economy have come from the space industry. And the technologies that we can create of making uh, a habitable environment on the moon or Mars is the same technology that we can use to feed uh, people on Earth and actually take a serious uh, jab at world hunger. Uh, that sounds like a beauty pageant claim, but uh, quite frankly, the space industry can resolve world hunger, especially to what it's currently at right now. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, no, it easily can. It's just because we're pushing those frontiers of, you know, survivability, just, you know, general like well being. And it, what I love about it is that it's so focused on just the longevity of the human race as, as a whole. And I think it could even solve homelessness. I mean, considering the type of like modern structures that we're going to have to build in order to survive on, you know, a foreign celestial body, the type of architecture and design that we're going to have to have to house people could easily be pivoted and reapplied and adapted to here on earth to help, you know, to help solve problems with with homelessness. And I, I believe there's, there's not a single problem on earth, you know, maybe other, I would say other than politics, but then the more that I think about it, like even I think, you know, going to, going to another planet and establishing, you know, some political structure there might even, you know, reformat or make us rethink what we're doing here. And so I, I, it comes down to like, I think there's not a problem that we can't solve here on earth by going to space. Like, I, I think it just, I don't know if I said that right, but, but I was, so um, space, you'd be surprised how much it benefits geopolitics. It's pretty much the only guaranteed place where there's going to be peaceful scientific interaction. Um, and so I mean, there's not, I would say there's not something that space doesn't touch. Yeah. <laughs> if you really think about that, that's like definitely true. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think just, you know, getting people to wrap their minds around that is sometimes a little bit difficult just because, you know, it's, it's hard to envision, you know, the, this, cause you don't see everything, especially, you know, when it comes up to, or it's like hard to understand everything that's going on, not only geopolitically, but also just you know socially and then just like like psych- psychologically i mean there's so many different like areas of understanding what it means for just people being in space working in space and working together um like all of those things come together to benefit human life as a whole regardless of what planet we're on regardless of what celestial body or what space station we're on you know I, all of those endeavors come forth to benefit humanity as a whole and that's, I think, what I love about it so much. So, you know, we, we, we touched on that, and I, and I love that idea, you know, just making sure they realize all of the things that have come out of the space industry and all the things that can come from exploring further into space. Like, those are, those are definitely good considerations that I think everybody should have. Is there anything else that people should know? Um, space is for everyone. <laughs> Um, goodness, you know, I'm drawing a blank at this moment. <laughs> well, we might um, need to say that again for the people in the back space it is for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, there's, that's the only way to go forward. I would say, uh, we can't be limiting people. Um, if someone has a dream of going to space, I think we should entertain that and try to make it possible. Um, not give them excuses of why they're not good enough. Exactly exactly i like spoken perfectly you know just we cannot allow any limitations to get in their way i feel like if if somebody has that dream somebody has those aspirations there's there's a way to get them there and i can't wait to be you know a part a part of a society that's so inclusive in that dream in that pursuit of pushing humanity further and that inclusive nature you know just getting more people up there to experience and visually see our earth in its entirety, our biosphere, our little spaceship, you know, the pale blue dot. Just, the more people that see that, I think the better. I mean, on a psychological note, it's, I think it's going to shift sociology <laughs> on such a grand scale. Absolutely. So yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic. I love, I love that answer. And definitely important just to to move forward with an inclusive mentality i think that is essential to moving forward you know in the space industry and getting people more interested more engaged in the industry is you know we are we already do it within the community we're already inclusive within the community but we have to branch that out you know we have to to reach out and, and allow people to understand that it is inclusive. We have to, we have to tell them like, no, no, we're inclusive now. It's <laughs> yeah. Well, and so it's important to also note uh, the difference between diversity and inclusion. 
uh, or inclusivity. A, a group of people can be diverse, uh, but that does not mean that it is an inclusive group. But an inclusive group will always be diverse. Um, is one way to think about it, or that I think about it. Oh, I like that. I like that because I think that's an important distinction. You know, the, just ensuring that you know we're not approaching it from just a diversity standpoint, where you have multiple different types of people. Because, like you said, there's no guarantee that it's inclusive. You know, there still could be you know certain biases or something that lean lean a certain way towards you know different groups within that. Um, but when you when you talk about inclusion and an inclusive environment, that it will always be diverse. I couldn't agree more. I think that's a great way to put it. So for for people that are either just getting you know started in the space industry, maybe are trying to find their path or or even just they're already in it, but they're they're just wanting to know more. Like, what's your knowledge or advice that you have to give to those people? Uh, I would say ask questions. Uh, don't well, if I may use Clubhouse as an example. Don't be afraid to get on stage. Um, it's it can be a little overwhelming, uh, but one way to look at a situation, a social situation where you're feeling anxious is that perhaps that's not anxiety, uh, but rather that's excitement that you're confusing it for. Um, because I mean, if I didn't try to speak or just ask questions or you know be part of the conversation, um, I wouldn't be able to hang out with Dr. Jim Green quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I concur. I concur with that because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I'm at either if I, if I hadn't taking that opportunity, you know, and somebody pulls me up on stage, I could have easily just said, oh, maybe later, you know, but getting up there, asking questions, engaging. Um, and I, I love how you put that, because I think there is so many instances where I've even confused excitement with anxiety. <laughs> and so I, I like that's such good, like, perspective or advice to give, because a lot of people don't think about that in the moment. You know, because you, you almost feel the same way. It's almost like that that rush, you know, that you get. It, it's very, very similar to the feeling that you get when you're anxious. And making that distinction in the moment is typically hard. But I think being more mindful of that and just kind of going for those opportunities that are more exciting, you know, yeah. is definitely don't let anxiety get in the way. Uh, and if you're not... Uh, how's the saying go? Um, if you're not afraid, you're not being brave, something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's always good advice to give. <laughs> it's always good advice to give, but I, I couldn't agree more. Just go out, ask questions. I mean, within the space community as an entire whole, the one thing that I've loved so much about it is everyone's willing to share knowledge. Everyone is willing to, to brainstorm, bounce ideas off of each other and share their knowledge so if you have questions ask them people will answer it's it's so inclusive because i mean you even have nasa's chief scientist like you said jim green i've been in multiple rooms where as soon as he hops in i mean he's up on stage people are asking him questions and he's he's such a such a lighthearted guy and i and i, I appreciate you know his insight on a lot of those a lot of people you know uh, almost follow him around clubhouse religiously <laughs> I am definitely a Jim Green fan girl. That is, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't blame you. I mean, his insight on a lot of those and the way he answers the questions, I think it's just, it's really great, you know, and it, it reminds us that, you know, it's, that's the kind of, you know, inclusive nature, that inclusive community that we're building in the space industry right now. And, you know, the more like communication that we have of that almost transition, because the people within the community and the industry know that, we're inclusive and you know it's a lot more open now and i think it's just the communication and kind of getting that that new image of the space industry out to everybody i think has been the difficult part yeah i mean it's especially when you're in it like you we we can recognize how uh, there's a big push forward in inclusivity however being mindful that the people that aren't in it might not see it that way yet like they still might see it the way they saw at the end of the 90s kind of thing um, and so it's tricky to be cognizant of what other people don't know, or at least I, I try my best. Um, and 
just you know making sure that uh like let's say i don't know i'm thinking of this like a teacher or like when i am trying to get my students interested in space is like what's fun what's not scary i mean some of them like scary stuff uh but like what what's a good way to like spark this interest without like you know having the discuss nuclear energy or something <laughs> yeah yeah and i think the the biggest like limiting factor is just how intimidating space is you know when, when people think about it or just you know the vastness you know just the complexity I, I think on the surface a lot of people see it as intimidating um and so i think breaking almost that stigma that it is intimidating and you know allowing people to feel comfortable is is difficult you know <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you know that as like an instructor and as, as somebody who spent a lot of time getting people like passionate and getting people, you know, engaged within the community. I'm sure you can attribute to that, that it's kind of difficult to break that intimidating factor that comes with space. Uh, to be fair, there's a lot of rocket scientists and astronauts, uh, but they are all regular people. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> That's good to keep in mind, you know, it's... and. I, I love this transition to commercialization. I think that along with like that multiplanetary mindset, like those two are just fundamental to some of my core, you know, values and how I see the future is just, and what we need to do now to get to that is, you know, shift people into that multiplanetary mindset, but then get them excited, motivated, engaged, and making their impact on the commercialization of space. Because it's, it's going to be the industry of the future. It's, the industry of the present and you may not see it now but it's going to be the biggest thing in human history so i say what better time to be a part of it than now <laughs> it's a cool time to be alive yeah it really is and so exciting so exciting to see where we're going and what we're doing now and you know to see the commercial the commercial crew <laughs> kind of stepping up and we're seeing you know right now li like quite literally at this very moment there is an actress and a director yeah. on the International Space Station, yep. right, and they are up there filming a movie. Uh, like these things, I think people should just know. Like I think that's so cool. Just it's again breaking down that stigma of you have to be this like elite, you know, like just crazy, ridiculous monster of a human being <laughs> in order yeah. to get there. It's just. We can have average people, film crew. We can have just, you know, fun. We can have fun. They're also sending up William Shatner sometime soon. Yes. And he'll be the oldest person uh, to go up. Yes. I think that's going to be awesome. It's, I think he's doing a suborbital flight with Blue Origin. I can't remember the details, uh, but I did hear talk of possibly even all the way to the ISS. Hmm. Now, that would be intriguing if you got him on Crew Dragon and definitely an interesting <laughs> PR stunt to get. Captain Kirk up there. <laughs> Especially for how many hours he's logged pretending being in space. <laughs> yes, I think it would be monumental, I think, for for the community as a whole. You know, and as we see like more celebrities and you know, people like that have such a big public impact, you know, the they're probably gonna be at least like the gateway to breaking down that stigma. You know, when we have movie I think Tom Cruise is meant to go up at some point too, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Maybe that's who's supposed to go to the ISS. I think Tom uh, yeah. Cruise was going to the ISS. I think William Shatner was doing the suborbital flight with Blue Origin. From from my current knowledge, I'd have to double check my research on that. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts <laughs> to yeah. keep track. Yeah, there is, but that's why I think it's so exciting because you know we're having like these public figures breaking down that stigma, saying, "Hey, you know, I, yeah, you know, I was an actor for all these years or something, but." You know, even I can go to space and make this happen and, and do what I love up there, which I think is what we need to be perpetuating to young kids. And we really need to be pushing that idea of you can do what you love and you can do it in space, which is like a thousand times cooler. <laughs> Don't get me um, wrong. You, you got to love planet Earth, though. <laughs> one thing I think is really nifty is in the entertainment industry, uh, we are seeing more representation, like more cartoons like, taking place in space. Um, and, and so that is a wonderful way of engaging the young minds of what's possible or what could be. Um, whereas when I was a kid, that 
like Marvin the Martian was about as consistent of a space program as I remember, but yeah, Mar I love that, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, I love that they're pushing that edge. I think it was the, the Robinsons were their name. Is that? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of, some of those, yeah, were kind of, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the originals, but we're, we're breaking into this like new age, especially with you know, modern entertainment, I think it's definitely putting forth like a better, better foot for the kids and allowing them to get engaged more. And yeah, I think that's so important is just giving our youth a different idea of what it means to, to be a part of like space exploration. And NASA has an immense amount of educational material. So like no matter your age, they have curated content, uh, for whatever your uh, learning level is, which is really cool. Uh, th there's so much available data uh, that most people don't know that they have access to. Yeah, they really don't. I mean, there, there's so many outlets, you know, for gaining and growing your collective knowledge, you know, on the subject of everything in the space industry. I mean, that's why I said, like, we, we share knowledge so, so openly and freely. It feels like, you know, there's, there's certain things that they have to be you know, a little exclusive about it, especially when it comes to like hyperbolic fuel <laughs> and, and, you know, just rocket engineering in general, they have to be a little bit, you know, tight about that. They can't have a kid building, you know, a rocket in his backyard. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the main, the main problem that I'm trying to solve is I think you're right. There is a lot of different, you know, outlets for them to go and find that knowledge. But I do, I think we're lacking, in the area that actually brings the knowledge to them and provides them almost a path to to filter out everything that doesn't necessarily apply to them their passions and their direction in life and so i i think being a little bit more mindful of that saying instead of just saying oh here's a pool of knowledge like you find your way i i want to establish something that actually explores that end and say well what what are you passionate about what does align with what you want to do and what do you see in your future? Okay, well now let's build you like, you know, step by step, like how to, how to get into a path that makes the biggest impact, you know, in the, in the space community for you. And I think that's what we're lacking in right now is just that engagement of that mentoring, that coaching and giving them, you know, a really, a really realistic type of path, you know, so they can visually see it and map it out. Yeah, we need a lot more advocates uh, and outreach. Um, I mean, I, the best example of that is uh, Michelle Nichols. Um, I, I would love to do what she has done uh, and travel around the country and just, you know, inform and educate people. Uh, but like, that literally is what we need. And a lot of these astronaut training programs, I, that is their goal. Like it's, I've tried to collect some of this information just my on my own and it's a lot to try to process and so i'd say like what you're trying to do is is very beneficial uh for a lot of people because i mean it's not easy to figure out oh when might i be able to work in scuba training or like flight lessons or like those kind of things it's it, it's a lot to assemble um and so i think you all are doing society a service thank you thank you just trying to make an impact but i think the biggest thing is just yeah you know, changing that stereotype of people that are into space. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to my motto there at the end, which, which really brings that all together. But um, so yeah, beyond that, I mean, this is, this has just been a great, you know, conversation. I loved hearing about your story, how you get passionate about space and just all of these incredible things that you're doing you know, at the same time. I mean, I, I know I, I struggle with organization, but oh scheduling is, is is difficult and i think it's i think it's incredible just being you know an instructor that you are bringing people into the community and then you know finding time to jump on clubhouse and moderate some moderate some fantastic discussions i think there's there's so much that you're doing i definitely admire you for all of that that you're pursuing and and so you know with that you know who should who should i interview next you know, I really think uh, Dr. Eduardo Diaz would be a good one next. Um, who knows, maybe you all could team up. Um, but they have some exciting news. Um, yeah, 
you both are very on point. Um, I don't know what, what age group are you hoping to provide your... So with the education platform that um, I'm currently building right now, um, ideally I'd want that to extend all the way to like middle school or earlier where we can get these kids engaged and give them a platform that guides them through the knowledge mm -hmm. gives it's like shows them not only the different opportunities but then will guide them through the knowledge that they need for that for that path and so my education platform is going to stem definitely to a younger age group and we're probably going to be doing some regional events or some you know public speaking at schools um, a lot of those things and then what we want to provide, I think the core center like of what I'm building is, and this is going to be basically 18, 18 and up, I'm thinking like the age restriction is going to be there just because we want to provide what I call it is astronaut certification. Just I call it certification because we're not training career astronauts. We're not training people for a specific mission, but we're allowing people to go through the closest experience that they can for that. And giving them almost this like psychological effect of like getting prepared to go to space. And so, I mean, there's going to be a centrifuge. We're going to have a facility where they can do like a, basically a mission with the team. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to have like a full immersive experience with the full training, you know, team building exercises and, you know, a whole like knowledge section where you have to you know, learn the mechanics, and then it's going to be based off of the destination that they'd like to go to, whether it be low Earth orbit, the moon, or Mars. We're going to tailor it towards, you know, where they want to be and what they want to do and make sure we have that very inclusive nature of bringing people in that are going down different paths, but showing them how they can leverage those different paths and what they're passionate about to come together and then put something forward in the space industry and just prepare to be in space. So, um, that's good. One more, yeah, go ahead. I, I'd also recommend uh, Ted Tudama. He uh, from magnitude.io. Um, he has sent up several uh, student constructed uh, research projects to the ISS. Um, and, have, and so he'd be another really good one. Uh, uh, what's the name? Ted Tudama. It ends with an I. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, great. Uh, definitely we'll reach out. And I, um, I'm working with Dr. Diaz right now on scheduling to cool. have him on and talk a little bit more about, you know, what we're, what we're building as well, just to get his, you know, his program expertise. Um, so, yeah, ideally that's what we're tailoring to is we're trying to make it almost across all different boards we want to have you know a way for anybody to get involved regardless of your age and the certification is aligned with getting people you know just in the mindset of i'm i'm ready you know i'm ready to go and then they can train for their specialized missions um when the, when they actually get the spot so but there's a lot of people that grow up wanting to be astronauts and really eager and wanting to go through that training and get certified get certified but then they, they lose touch of that. They they start to see it as unrealistic. And so I think if we provide, you know, almost a baseline certification, it, it'll, it'll like minimize, you know, the people that go through and see it as unrealistic. So that's what I aim to do. We're also going to set up regional events where we're going to have almost like a simulated VR experience of like being in space with like a harness hookup and everything. And there's, there's a lot of different... There's a lot of different things we're working on right now, brainstorming so many ideas of, you know, engagement and getting people inspired and motivated to, to be a part of space. And um, I don't really want to limit it to age groups, but I think what, if I put them in a centrifuge, I'd say 18 plus is good. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that. Uh, yeah, that'd be, bring a bit more peace of mind. <laughs> yeah, I can't, you know, I can't put a 13 year old in there and, it, you know, <laughs> put six G's on them. So right um, definitely 18 plus on that but without uh, a wait yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but ideally we'd want to give them the education platform so that way they can prepare mentally for it and kind of get on that path so we can say you know you know leverage this while you're young and then you know once you know you hit 18 we can get you in the program and start you know giving giving you that immersive experience and so 
Yeah, thanks for the recommendations. I'll definitely reach out to them. And then, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll see Dr. Diaz on here sometime in the near future. Um, so now we come down to my final question. So this is just a question I ask everybody. I love this question. Uh, by far my favorite icebreaker, but I... <laughs> I have to ask because I'm collecting like these videos. I want to do like a big montage. This one's my main one. So, you know, of all the philosophical questions I can ask, I think this is by far my favorite. What do you think about when you look up? Uh, well, honestly, if I'm looking at the moon, one of the first serious thoughts I think to myself is I'm going to go there. Um, if I'm not looking at the moon, I'm trying to figure out whether it's a star or a planet and how far away it is. And potentially what time that came from, because uh, these are signatures, uh, ancient signatures finally reaching our eyes. So some star light is older than others. <laughs> nice. Very, very engaging. Because I think, yeah, that's not something a lot of people think about is, yeah, we're, we're seeing into the past when we look up. and. So, I love it because yeah, some of those stars, I mean, it takes like the nearest one takes at least four years. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, I mean, hundreds, thousands, you know, millions of years to get to our eyes. So um, it's really, you know, it, it, it's really humbling, I guess is a good way to put it. You know, when, when you think that deeply and I, I love your initial responses. Yeah. If I'm looking at the moon, I'm telling myself I'm going there because I, I have the exact same thought when I look at the moon too, even through a telescope or just with my own eye. I'm looking at it like, I'm going to go there one day. I'm going to be on them. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and so definitely, like I said, just just inspiring to hear everything that you're doing currently and all the ways that you're, you know, putting forth this, this like new idea, this and f being such a big contributor to this new community that we're building, you know, with space. And I, I love more than anything, having the opportunity to share, you know, that with the world and, you know, really bringing that community forward and saying, you know, it's, it's not the same, but it's, it's so awesome. <laughs> and I, I just, everyone needs to be a part of it. So I can't thank you enough for what you're doing to contribute to that and the impact that you're making, not only in the space community, but on all different sides of the world. So um, thank you again for everything that you're doing and everything that you will do. And, uh, maybe we'll have another, maybe we'll have a chat, you know, on the moon someday. Absolutely. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Um, uh, I feel very flattered. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was great to have you here and I'll be doing this every Friday. So I'll definitely think about having you back on. We can talk about just like a Mars colony, like for the entire time <laughs> for a nice. whole hour and just kind of really bring a lot of this thing. So I know we have the, the clubhouse talk about it, but uh, I'd love to have you on here just to talk about the multiplanetary possibilities and how that would look, because that's, that's one of the big things that a lot of people think about is, you know, why would we go to other planets? Why is that important? You know, what is that going to do for us? Why are people obsessed with Mars? I mean, I've heard a lot of questions. <laughs> I've heard a lot of questions like that. It's just why bother, you know? And yeah. I, th I think it's just that feasibility that people are, are not really grasping onto because I, in our minds, the people that, you know, are not only passionate about it, but understand what's going on. Like we see this in our near future. We see this as inevitable. We see this as the more people that we get engaged, the faster this is going to happen, the more likely that it's going to happen within my lifetime. And I think that's why we're so enabled, you know, to, to push forward and bring people in just because we want to accelerate it as fast as possible. So, um, yeah, any final thoughts? Well, final thoughts, goodness. Um, uh, one, this is lovely, thank you for inviting me to the opportunity. Um, I guess additional final thoughts is if folks are not on Clubhouse, they should definitely get on Clubhouse and join Small Steps and Giant Leaps. Um, the largest space club on Clubhouse very inclusive, um, quality content through and through. Um, a lot of really interesting people, uh, folks you might have never anticipated, you might interact with, uh, might be end up interacting with on your daily basis, if not weekly or so. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, if you want to meet an astronaut, that's one of the best ways. Um, tomorrow, I, I suppose this part might, well, anywho, for example, tomorrow, Cyan Proctor will be on Clubhouse. Um, and that would be an opportunity to interact with her. And so you don't necessarily have to go all the way to a spaceport uh, to see a launch or interact with these folks. Like they're, they're all quality folk uh, trying to make the world a better place. And not just this world, but the rest of it too. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I couldn't agree more like the people that you meet, not only on Clubhouse, but just in Small Steps and Giant Leaps in particular. It's it's just such a, a great community of people. And, you know, that's where I met, you know, my co-founders. <laughs> and yeah. that's that's how I'm able to, to manifest this idea that I had of just being a communicator. You know, I think that was my initial intentions was like, oh, I just want to be a communicator and kind of public voice you know, almost like a PR representative for the space industry. And then, um, you know, the astronaut certification and stuff was just like almost a, an idea. I was like, oh, I want to want to get to that at some point. And they were like, no, let's do that now. <laughs> so it's just you, you meet some incredible people and they're going to push you to be the best person that you can be and allow you to feel included and just make your impact. And and I, I love every bit of that. So. Uh, I agree with him. If you're not on Clubhouse, get on Clubhouse. When you do get on Clubhouse, let's get you on Small Steps and Giant Leaps. Get into those conversations. Jump up on stage. You know, get excited because there's just so many great conversations that have been had in there, and so many more to come. So it's a great place to meet people and get excited about space. So thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you again to everybody that's going to watch this in the future. Now, I'm not big on this, but I will say just like, favorite, comment, subscribe, everything that you can do. Follow Shane Krapata on social media. The links for those are in the description. Definitely follow him. Great guy. And I am so glad that I could have you on today. So, uh, yeah, to everybody here, thanks again for watching. This has been a Not Normal Friday at 5 with me, Andrew, the founder and CEO of Not Normal. So a lot of big announcements coming soon, a lot of big moves being made behind the scenes. You heard a couple sneak previews of what's to come within this conversation, but I will tell you there's so much more happening and so much more that we're going to be able to share with you soon. And I couldn't be thankful for every single one of you that's out here to help support me in building this idea that I had, this, this passion of mine, building it into something so much more monumental than even I had originally intended. We're we're hoping to just start a movement, like a not normal movement, you know, of bringing just everybody, the entire, you know, realm of humanity, the whole human kingdom, just, we'll bring the whole, you know, we'll just say, we'll bring the whole animal kingdom in there, you know, dogs in space, it's, it's, it's what we need, right? Um, so I can't thank all of you enough. Thanks again. And with that, I will call it there. Thank you very much. We are making not normal the new normal. Have a fantastic rest of your Friday, everybody. Existence already includes non-existence. You could say being and non-being constitute existence. Just as we know physically, sound is constituted by sound silence in very rapid alternation. So a being, non-being, constitute existence. And existence is something of which you may say the game is worth the candle. If it weren't, it wouldn't be. It's like that. Some people try to say there is good and bad.